Hi, everybody. I'm Donna Anderson, author of lovefraud.com, and I'm here once again with my good friend and colleague, Dr. Leanne Leadham. Dr. Leadham is a psychiatrist and also a professor of counseling at the University of Bridgeport. So welcome, Dr. Leadham. It's so good to see you again. Oh, great. Always great to see you, Donna. Okay, so today we're going to talk about uh, psychological abuse, which many people who have been involved with narcissists, psychopaths, and sociopaths have endured. So what would you say are the general categories of abuse that, that people can get involved with? Well, I presented this in the first of our webinar series, so I'm just going to... Uh, talk about what I, summarize what I discussed in that um, webinar. So the general categories are emotional abuse. So I call it emotional abuse because it's abuse that induces an emotion um, in the other person. Um, the next one is psychological control, which uh, is consists of gaslighting, lying, and manipulating. Um, the third is just general control of the person's life. And then there is social abuse and jealousy. Those are research-based categories of psychological abuse. Okay. And beyond that, of course, there's other types of abuse, like financial, sexual, and physical abuse. And um, in our research, you know, we found that most people endure emotional and psychological abuse like the, the, the responses are like 90% say that they have, right. um, whereas physical abuse is often down as low as 41%. So this is much more widespread um, than, than the other types of abuse. Um, so anyhow, in the mindfulness webinar, you described uh, these categories of psychological abuse, including gaslighting, lying, and manipulation. So let's talk about them. What exactly is gaslighting? We hear this term a lot these days. So, so what is it? So gaslighting is lying to the person, yes, but in a way that gets the person to question their own sanity or to question their own perceptions of reality. So in other words, uh, don't believe your lion eyes that, that um, the, the survivors is led to believe that they were mistaken about um, what they think they saw, heard, or felt, and they're given an alternative uh, reality. Mm. So then what's the relationship between gaslighting and lying? Because I guess lying is part of gaslighting. Right. Lying is always part of gaslighting. I think the important thing for people to realize that, you know, maybe people realize this earlier in life than I did. But when I studied this and I figured I understood that if you want to control someone else, the best way to do it is through lying mm. because when you control someone's view of reality then you control them so the motivation behind all lying is power and control mm. and so okay go ahead well no go ahead Tell, power and control right so so that power and control can either be to get the person to question themselves so much that that they're reduced in stature so to speak and they feel like they're the shell of the person they used to be if, if you feel like that then you know you've been a victim of gaslighting um or it can just be just deception to control how you view them um early on in the relationship they lie about key aspects of themselves, like how much education they have, whether or not they served in the military, um, their family of origin, um, their health status maybe, um, their, their, how many times they've been married. Um, it's, the list goes on and on. The, the idea is to control the, per, the, person's, per, the other person's perception of reality. 
So then how does all this tie into manipulation? So manipulation is using psychological tactics to get somebody to do something that they wouldn't otherwise want to do. And so um, I'm just looking here at the, the scale that was where some researchers made up some questions to assess this. And, and a couple of the items on the scale were acting sarcastically until the partner would give in to do what they wanted. That's manipulation. Using the silent treatment to get the partner to give in or using a high degree of anger until they give in. That would be manipulation. So manipulation is maybe more overt, although manipulation can also be covert. And I, I guess another way that they do it is like the pity play, because a lot of people tell me that they, you know, the person tries to make them feel sorry for them. And, and so, you know, that is, is also a strategy that they can use. Right. They all play the victim. Okay. So in your experience, do most survivors realize that they're being psychologically abused? I think many do not until we start asking them specifically about these different categories. Many don't recognize it and many don't realize how out of the norm of relationships this is. And, and you know, I have to kind of keep myself in check because I'm used to talking to partners of these individuals, but I think maybe even more than a partner a person whose parent or parents were sociopaths or are sociopaths often don't recognize that they were psychologically abused, or if they do, they really underestimate the extent of it and what the effect was on them. So can you discuss that a little bit more as far as what happens when someone grows up with a parent who is manipulative and psychologically abusive? Yes, I think the, well, the first thing is the outcome depends on the person's underlying temperament. Because if, if for people that didn't receive a lot of nurturing when they were developing, their temperament is going to come out one way or the other. So in people that had a very strong temperament, um, this often results in an over-reliance on oneself and an inability to trust others. And also in the, in the families where the, the physical needs were, were taken care of and the educational needs were provided for maybe middle-class or more families, what the, what the child who becomes an adult can be left with is an inability to manage their own anxiety and fear and sadness. And, and that inability, because in, in normal parent-child relationships, the parent plays a role in, in loving the child and helping them cope with their negative emotions. So, so for children who didn't have that, when they grow up, they don't have the tools to cope with their negative emotions and they're more likely to turn to maladaptive coping styles like using alcohol or substances or using sex um, or becoming a workaholic uh, to help them deal with their negative emotions. And doesn't this um, also have the possibility of le leading to people becoming people pleasers? Oh, yes. So, and that would be if, if the um, parents, any sort of security that was provided was contingent on the child giving up their autonomy, giving up their themselves, um, that would definitely happen. And, and also then uh, children who grew up with disordered parents often don't recognize that normally parents delight in their child expressing themselves, delight in their child being, having the interest that the child has, that, that parents don't normally try to impose all of their will 
on the child in terms of, you know, everything we do. Um, that that they just got used to growing up that way, being told they had to play certain sports or being told they had to like certain things or or have certain hobbies or study certain topics in school. And, and so they don't even know anymore what they like, what are they about, because everything was imposed on them from outside. So how can people identify when they're being psychologically abused? Well, I'm a fan of some of these self-report measures. So in the webinar series, <laughs> I'm sharing some questions from the measures. Um, so I don't know if you want to ask me to, you know, give you some of the items that assess some of these things. Well, how about um, a few of them? Yeah, let's do a few so people get a better idea. Okay, so for gaslighting, you um, a, a low level item on gaslighting. So, so in this inventory, it goes from not so bad to really bad. So the not so bad item was withheld or limited information by which the partner could check out the reality of situations. So again, I wanna recognize that a partner could be child if you were the child of one of these people. So only giving you half of the information you need to understand say what happened in your family. And then the worst item was did sneaky behaviors to make the partner think they were going crazy by making things seem like they were not the way the partner thought they were? And again, this is a deliberate uh, tactic. Okay, so um, how does your webinar series help people overcome psychological abuse? Well, we we uh, talk about I helping you identify the extent to which you suffered these things or experienced these uh, kinds of abuse. And then throughout the webinar series, it, we introduce a number of skills that people can use to assist them in staying, staying in contact with reality and uh, and in managing their emotions that in both of those things can be affected um, uh, by by trauma from relationships. Okay, and I, I just thought of another thing that you and I have discussed in the past, and it, it might be helpful to include um, in, in this conversation. And that okay. is the idea that um, sociopaths like bring people into their own personal cult. So can you describe that a little bit and, and how it affects the survivor? Oh yeah. So I would, I would put that under the uh, rubric of gaslighting in a sense. So all sociopaths in my experience have their own little worldview or big worldview and their worldview is unique to them. It's kind of a belief system by which they interpret the world. And of course, due to the nature of the disorder, they are the, of course the center of their own, own worldview. And so often they have indoctrinated the people in their lives with the belief that they have some kinds of extraordinary abilities, either they're extraordinarily intelligent or skilled in some way or, or knowledgeable in some way. And, and I, a lot of people have told me about uh, being indoctrinated that, you know, along the ideas of a cult, uh, indoctrinated that the sociopath has some spiritual beliefs or spiritual, um, not just beliefs, but spiritual um, powers that they can use. And, and so the, the uh, people in their lives adopt this worldview, and then that worldview colors everything that they experience. So, so a healthy worldview allows a person to take in their experiences and categorize them and understand them and make sense of them. But an unhealthy worldview or, or a distorted worldview 
causes people to have misperceptions of, of their state and misperceptions of people. And so we want to help people understand the degree to which they were influenced by a sociopath's sick worldview and help themselves get free of that worldview and to explore it, to understand, well, what parts of it were, were completely dysfunctional and what parts of it, maybe they might want to say some parts of it were okay, but to understand what, what that worldview was and how it influences them on a daily basis. And you also made the comment that psychological abuse affects your perceptions. So can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, well, the main way it does is if you're living with a lot of negative emotion, with sadness, fear, anxiety, then just having those emotions on board is going to affect your thinking. And also, any emotional state like that is going to bias you to perceive things in a certain way. So, for instance, you know, if you're, you know, walking in the dark at night, you're going to be biased to detect anything that might be threatening to you. And, and so that's just the way our emotions work. When we're in, under the influence of our emotions, it biases our thinking. So we want to be aware, we want to become aware of our emotions and what they are as a way to limit the bias that happens um, in our thinking as a result of these emotional states. It may take a long time and a lot of work to reduce the emotional state itself, but we can, at first, the first step is to understand how that emotional state might be affecting a person's perceptions and their thinking. And then over time to reduce the intensity of the emotional states. And that is the path to feeling better, right? Right. Right. And, and that's the objective of the whole series is to help people to learn how to use these skills to kind of get unstuck so that they can feel better. Right. And so that they can live a fulfilled life. And our, our goal for me, Donna, the goal isn't just feeling better. The goal is post-traumatic growth. I believe that most people can end up better than they would have been had they not had this experience, that there's, they certainly can end up wiser. So I'd like to help people go from feeling wounded to having triumphed over this experience and to feeling stronger for the experience. Well, that's just fabulous. So thank you very much, Dr. Leadham. I appreciate it. And uh, I know that this information is going to be so helpful to people. And I'm looking forward to continue to work with you on presenting this information. Yep. And thank you for all you do, Donna, on behalf of all the Love Fraud audience. We admire you and we're just so grateful that you took on this job because your work has been very important to many, many people. Thank you. I appreciate it.